Sometimes, sometimes when we read the Bible, we don't understand how it connects with us, why, why it's important for us to read it. And so sometimes I, I, think that, I think that in our search to make the Bible mean something to us, we get a little bit off track of what it's trying to tell us. And so tonight we're going to be talking about the selfish gospel. And what I mean by the selfish gospel is sometimes we make the Bible revolve completely around us rather than understanding, you know, what it's, what it's saying. Um, and we're not going to talk about everything that I want to talk about tonight. This is hopefully going to be a two-parter if, if Pastor lets me do the other part. <laughs> um, so last time I, I, I talked, we talked about the five verses taken out of context, if you guys remember that. And... Um, I, I mentioned Romans 8.28 where it says all things work together for good. And I, I didn't really want to get into it, so I kind of just blew over it and the, the, you know, what it actually means because it kind of takes a minute to get into it. Um, but tonight we're going to be looking at um, Romans 8.28 8 and Jeremiah 29.11. So if you could turn to Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. Okay, and we're going to read from verse 1 all the way to, uh, to right after 28. Um, because you can't really get what he's saying by just reading the verse by itself. So Romans 8, 1, everybody there? Okay, all right. And uh, you know, please read along with me. This is what it says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of, of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the, um, to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is to die, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, ha you however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is, is life because of righteousness. So let me stop there. Does everybody kind of get the idea of what he's talking about here? He's talking about, you know, the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, right? Okay. So, so let's just take that. I'm going to do a lot of summarizing now to kind of move us quickly. So in, in 8.1, he's talking about the Christian's new position. Um, in 8.12, he talks about the Christian's obligation, of, uh, you know, their obligation in life. In 8.18, he talks about the end result of fighting the flesh, glory. Here, you can see it here, 8.18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So he's talking about that. And then in, uh, in 8.26-27, he talks about the Holy Spirit um, interceding for our, for our weakness uh, according uh, to God's will. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit interceding for our weakness according to God's will. Let's pick up there, uh, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let's stop there and kind of look back. Now, when, when you're reading the Bible, it's important to read it as if you've never read it before. So sometimes, sometimes we take this and say, okay, everything in life is going to be good to me, basically. You know, I, my finances are going to go good. My, you know, my car is not going to break down. I'm not going to get cancer and stuff like that. That doesn't happen to people like me. That happens to those other people. You know what I mean? They just don't have faith enough. See what I mean? Th these are kinds of the kinds of the thoughts that that oftentimes we we have when we go to this, and that's really not not what he's talking about. Um, so, so how do I want to say this? I, I'm going to kind of reword this to give you kind of a kind of a better understanding. God causes or directs um, 
all things, such as struggles, failures, temptations, um, or your, your fleshly weakness, in other words, um, to work together for good. Now, this word good doesn't necessarily mean, like, okay, when we, th- when we think of the word good, we think of, like, you know, I got to raise it, raise it at work. That was good, right? That's not the good that he's talking about here. Um, it's more of conformity to Christ. The, the, the good here in mind is con- what, conf- what works us into the image of Christ. That is, that is the good that he's talking about. So all things God is working together to help us to be more conformed into the image of Christ, basically. Uh, and some other, some other meanings of the word good would be fellowship with God, testimonies, good fruit, maturity, final rest with God. These are the things that God has in mind. See, because God's not, God's not overly concerned that we are perfectly happy with our lives here on earth because that's not the focus here. You know what I mean? Go, remember, God is the focus of the gospel, not us. Okay? So then, God, God is not, it, it, obviously God is, is, wants you to be, you know, content and whatnot, but his focus is on your growth, on your maturity, on your spiritual walk, and that, that, that you know him. That's what God is concerned about. Not that everything in life goes perfect, you know? I mean, think about the woman, think about the person uh, who was molested as a child. So you mean that God predestined that person to be molested by a child? Well, no, of course not. But God is able to work that. God is able to work that to help that person be conformed to the image of Christ. He's able to work that to the good, to uh, the ultimate good, that is. Um, so the good benefits others and glorifies God isn't always what we see as good. This is how you know if, if it's what God's talking about. Is it revolved and centered around what you see as good, or is it revolved around bringing good to other people and glory to God? The, the, let me give you an, let me give you a, a, a quick explanation here. Um, okay, so go, w- since I said it already, this person who's molested by molested as a child. Okay, um, God wants to bring you to the point of maturity and growth. Where, where first off, you don't have bitterness to that person. So you know there's that. But then when you don't have bitterness, you're able to go to other people and be a testimony to them, and kind of be a witness to Christ, a witness of Christ. So. In that sense, you're able to bring good to others. See, the focus is on others here. Your healing was not just so that you can say, I'm healed, but for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of others who aren't healed. See what I mean? Can I get what I'm saying here? So then also, um, that is centered on bringing glory to God. So you know that that's kind of, you know, what God has in mind. Everybody with me on this? Okay. Um, So if you were abused, if bound to alcohol, God causes these things to work work inside of you godliness righteousness, patience, faith. It's the attitude and behavior changes. You know what I mean? God is working good in that. Uh, uh, to bring, uh, which, bring, which will bring, bring glory to God and also will, will, will witness to other people. Um, so we see that here that the focus is not, it's not on us uh, personally. You know, it's not on me. All things work together for my good. No, not necessarily, no. Not, in fact, let's just say no. Um, let's read that again and, and pretend like you haven't heard it again. And we know for that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. See, w- for, he's not talking about you individually. He's talking about us as the body. God, God is working the things in the body to bring him glory and to, and to benefit others in the body, and which also in turn helps out those in the world. Um, so we know he works things for good because those who he knew would accept he predestined to be conformed to Christ. For his glory. Let me read that again. We know he works. Uh, he we know uh, <laughs> we know he works things for good, because those who he knew would accept he predestined to be conformed to Christ. Uh, pay attention to what he says here. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he, whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Um, let me read a little bit more. Um, those who were predest- predestined were also called, given purpose, justified, put in right standing, and glorified. New life and resurrection in the end. Does everybody understand that? The, what, what, what it means to be called is that you're given a purpose. You know, God, God, God puts a purpose in your life. What it means to be justified is that you're now in right standing with God. You're not, you're not bound as guilty anymore because Christ has made you righteous. See what I mean? Our righteousness is, is the fact that Christ died for us. Um, and then 
uh, are, uh, and, and then those who are glorified, because first off, we have a new life now, so it brings glory to God, uh, uh, in, in a way, it brings glory to God now, because our life has changed, and people see that, but then also, uh, it, it speaks of what will happen in the resurrection, um, so yeah. Uh, so this means God is fighting for us, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? See, it's a natural, natural flow that he's going there for. Therefore, nothing will, nothing will or can take us from God's, from God, uh, from God's love, which is in salva- <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is in Christ, which is our salvation. Um, are you kind of seeing what I'm saying here? Do I need to say that again? I'll say it again. Um, Therefore, nothing will or can take us from God's love which is in Christ, who is our victory. See, see, our victory is because of Christ, so our salvation is secure because Christ isn't going anywhere. See what I mean? So now let's kind of let's kind of give a give a kind of closing thing here. Um, Romans. If you go through Romans, in Romans chapter one, he's talking about uh, the people who he had to um, who he gave over to the lust of their flesh. He's talking about people, you know, he gave over to the lust of their flesh, okay? Now, in chapter 2, he talks about, about um, the, 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 the having the, ju- the judging heart. And then he's talking about, um, he gets into chapter 3 about, you know, um, basically talking about our sinfulness. Then he goes and starts talking about the difference between us and them and in, in that our spiritual man is uh, reawakened. Okay, and so then he, then he goes on into chapter 7. To talk about how the law no longer is is binding us because we are freed by the grace of God, but then he goes on to say that that doesn't mean that we should just act foolish. Then, you know, he, with that in mind, um, I think I'm missing a page. It's okay though, um, and then that brings us in, into chapter eight where he's talking about our life, um, our, uh, since, we are, since we are no longer bound by that, by that law and we live by the Spirit, he's talking about kind of our life in that Spirit, which brings us to, um, to his short discussion of, of how we are heirs with Christ, which Hebrews talks more about, which brings us to, to his, his concluding idea, this whole thing he's been building to- towards about uh, the future glory. So really what we see here we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. He's talking about, you know, these, these things that, they've been, that, that they're struggling with. You know, he, he just talked about the difference between us and the world and how, and how we're, we're not bound by the law and everything. And he's talking about the difference between us who live by the Spirit and those who live by the flesh. And so then, what better way than to say that these things that are of the flesh, God is, God is working towards. And it's, you know, he's, he's working it for the good of of the the body and for his glory. Does it kind of understand what, what he's saying here? Because I, I kind of want to move on. Does everybody understand it now? Okay. Uh, did I, I I know I know I didn't explain that as well as I could have. Did any was anything left un uh, unanswered? Um, let let's let's go back right quick before we go to Jeremiah. I I, I do want to kind of put it in its context now. She's kind of clarified where I was trying to say. So now let's look at look at twenty six through twenty nine. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, so that's exactly what she just said. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Have you ever been stumped as to what to pray for yourself or others? You just don't know what to pray. You, you just don't know what to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You know, we don't have perfect knowledge. We don't have perfect understanding. And we won't. We won't. Don't, don't worry too hard. You won't have perfect understanding. You're just a human. See what I mean? But that's okay, because as we're seeking after God, look what, look, what he, look what his word promises us. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay? Uh, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See what he's saying there? He, God is interceding according to God's will for the benefit of the saints. Okay? You, you, are you getting that? And which leads us to this. And we know that for those who love God, which is the body, he, who lo- notice what he says here. Who love God, and then uh, and at the end of the verse there, um, where is it? For those who are called according to his purpose. See, one is our, our, our uh, interest into God. The other is God's interest into us. Um, 
So, and we know that for those, uh, those who love God, all things work together. He, 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 he directs things to, to, to work character in us, uh, to bring us to, uh, uh, to the image of Christ um, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, obviously, we're not going to get into this, but did you know that if you pray, just because you pray for something, you're not going to get it? Does everybody kind of understand that God's not... I know pastors said this, but, but I think that it's kind of important to say it again. It's not, it's not, God's not serving us. Sometimes I think we get a little bit off. off. What is it that, what is it the pastor used to, all, used to say a lot? Uh, we don't play a tune and have God dance to it or something like that. that that's exactly right. You know, we, we kind of try to make the gospel and the Bible as a whole revolve around us. And the thing is, is, is a me-focused gospel is completely against what the Bible pr- uh, teaches completely against. If you're focused on you, something's wrong. Wh- what do you hear when people get divorced? What do you hear? They wronged me, right? That's usually what you hear. You, it's it variations of that, but it boils down to that, right? Who's the focus in that sentence? Well, I am. See what I mean? Because your focus is, you see what I mean? So when, when you come to church and only want to get fed, who's your focus on? Well, you. You're not, you're not interested in bringing the community to Christ. You're not interested in serving other people. You're not interested in, you know, um, making sure that your fellow brethren are, are, are growing and maturing. You're not interested in that. You're interested in getting your, your, your fill, either, either to pay off your conscience so you feel good that you went to church once in a blue moon, or, uh, uh, you know, because, well, it's pastor's job to, job to feed me the word, and then I'll go home. Well, no, it's not his job to feed you the word. It's your job to feed yourself the word. God gave it to you. You know, he spoke to you already. What, what are you waiting for? You know? It, it, it's pastor's job. I don't have time to get into this, but but the word that the word that ended up with us are being pastors is a shepherd. Okay, think of it like that. We are we are people. We are we are we are people who are wayward in all our ways, and we're going with going with the wind. It's the pastor's job to grab that 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 what is it called that crook or is that what it's called a crook and 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 wring us around the neck and say you're getting stra- astray, come back. That's what his job is to shepherd us. Not to feed us. We're not babies. You know what I mean? We're, we're supposed to be maturing here. And the sign of growth is this. This is how you'll know that you are growing. Are you ready for the big surprise? When you are focused on other people, are you doing a ministry, any ministry, that is focused on serving someone else? If so, then you're growing. When you pray, do you spend the whole time praying for yourself? See what I mean? Now, don't, don't laugh here, because a lot of times new Christians do do this, and, and amateur Christians do this a lot too. But it's, it's, it, it, there comes a point where if, let me, let me put this in context. What if you were to see Gracie throw herself on the floor in Walmart and, and just throw a fit, and, you know, her head's flying back, ah! What would you think? Well, that's a little bit ridiculous, isn't it? See what I mean? And it's the same thing— it, it's the same thing with us. If we've been saved longer than, you know, I'm not, it's, it's obviously not a date like that. It's not like, oh, well, you have to be mature by this date. I'm not saying that. But if you've been saved longer than like 10 years and your focus is still 100% completely on you, you're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? You need to seriously go to, go to the Lord in prayer and, and humble yourself and see if he speaks to you. Jeremiah 29, 11. And, and you know, Sandy brought this up about the, sand, about the sandpaper, uh, Sanding us down, the, the, being the problems in life. But th- there's this guy, Bill Gothard, and, and he gave the image that we are all diamonds, okay? We, we are all diamonds. And the, and, and the thing is, the thing is, uh, our parents, our, our dad is like a hammer and our, and our mom is like, a, like, a, like an, uh, a wedge. And yeah, chisel, yeah, exactly. And God is using them to plow us into a good-looking diamond because we're just a lump of ugly-looking, you know, Material, um, coal, exactly, exactly, and that's the image that he gave, and I just love that so much, and we're going to get into more into that um, when we talk about authority in the discipleship program, whenever that gets going, but, uh, but it, I, I just, I, it, it, this has been on my mind, and, and you know what, you know what section of the discipleship pl- program I'm working on right now? Authority structure, and it, it talks about the image of, of the chisel, and it just so happens that she, that she brings up the thing about sa- God's using problems to sand us down, yeah. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, sheep feed themselves. They, they, they graze and they and they, and they eat the, eat the grass. They don't go to the shepherd and say, "Hey, I'm hungry," you know. Okay, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, and 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 this is this is really an abused verse, 
really an abused verse. And I'll go ahead and read it so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, for I know, the, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Did everybody hear that? No, no, it's okay. Um, I'll read it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay, everybody look up from their Bible. Who is this, who is this written to? Yes, it was written to the nation of Israel. Okay, when was this written to Israel? While they were in captivity. Where were they in captivity? Babylon, yes. Egypt was a couple hundred years before. <laughs> um, okay, uh, why is that important to know? Why is that important to know? Ah, the reason why God gave this message. Oh, well then. Um, what we like to do with this verse, like many other verses, is, is, you know what happens if you don't understand the Bible in its context? In its context? You miss a message that could have benefited you at a different time. And you make the Bible say something that it did not say because you needed peace at a certain time rather than going to the body for comfort to be lifted up. The Bible says over and over again that, the, the, that one of the main purposes of the body, of us, we are the body, is to lift each other up. We're, when we're going through something, we're supposed to be there for one another. Is your brother weeping? Weep with him. Are you going through a personal trial or temptation? You're supposed to go and talk to someone else about it. Preferably if you're, like, let's say, for instance, be wise about this, okay? For instance, I'm lusting about this person, and I'm going to go tell that person I'm lusting about it. No, you're not, no, 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 no. That's just a bad idea. You would go to the pastor, for instance, would be a good idea. Or the person, you know, I, just don't, see what I mean? Be wise with this. I, okay, all right. So now let's look at this uh, in, its, in, its, in its context here. It, first off, Israel had, um, had uh, I don't understand what I wrote there. Uh, Israel had, uh, had lived in wickedness, um, and they were experiencing his discipline. This was a message that he gave of warning, of warning and of promise. But we shouldn't, under, we shouldn't misunderstand it. Um, so he had them conquered by Babylon, Babylon and taken to Babylon. So they were outside of their home. You know, they were in a strange land. Uh, he commanded them to keep on with life and pray for Babylon's welfare. Now, why was that important? Well, what? Well, yeah, but the idea here is Babylon was their enemy. They just, you know, w plundered the temple, their holy, their holy temple. They just plundered it. They took them out of the land that they knew. They, you know, did just really mean things. The Babylonians, the Babylonians weren't very nice people. Um, yeah, and basically they were slaves. They hated, they hated these people. And, and what, what does God command them to do here? Well, let's pick up in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, just in case we're not clear, who, who is it to? To all the, all the exiles? All of them, not just some of them, all of them. Build houses, and, and this is off topic. Did you know that we're not prisoners to the president? Did you know that? We're, we haven't been taken out of our land. Our houses haven't been taken from us. Our kids haven't been taken out of our sight. We're not forced to, to learn a strange, strange language. Did you know that? And regardless of whether or not we voted for him or not, he's the president. That's how authority works. See, the world tries to tell you this. Authority needs to, learn, needs to earn their place. And if you are an authority figure, it's probably good that you earn your place. You should earn it. That, that's absolutely true. But if you are talking about someone else in authority, you should be submitted. You should be yielded. Life will go a lot better for you. Um, so, in other words, you need to be praying for president, not, uh, not knocking him, not making fun of him. You need to be praying for him. You, you can't. Well, uh, you know, you can't. Build houses and live in them. Get comfortable, basically, is what he's saying. Plant, gar uh, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Carry on life. Take wives for, uh, for your son sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Whoa! We have to pray for someone that we hate 
and God will bless us when we do? Oh, yeah, it's the same thing. Same thing now. Uh, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Don't let them deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams uh, that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. I did not send them. And he comes back to this after he takes this short interlude right here um, in verse 10. He comes back to it around, I think it's 15. Um, Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in the city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them the people who were not taken in the exile. I am sending on them sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. Now, remember, we're talking about, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Remember that verse that we were talking about? These are the verses that are around that verse, okay? Now let's go to verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and the places where I have driven you. Now let's stop there. Do you know that God can, God can work the, the, the tragedies in your life for, 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 his, for, his, for his glory and for, and for you know, ultimate, uh, for, for, you know, for, for, for your, um, what's it, uh, I just said it, the, for you to be made into the image of Christ? God can do that. God can do that. What we do is we take this part and we, and we take it out of context and try to make it all about us. You will seek me and find you, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Well, yes, that is true. Did you know that? James, James says this. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That says that, yes. But that's not what he's talking about here. See what I mean? So what we've done is we've taken something that was written to a nation that had been disobedient and made it as a blessing to us when that's not what he's talking about at all. Let's, let's continue a little bit further. Deeper in, deeper in. Um, so, okay. So, notice here that God says that he will listen to them after the punishment. The punishment was unavoidable. Yeah. You, you know, we're going through Hebrews and, and, and young adults, and do you know what the emphasis of Hebrews is? Fix your eyes on Christ. If I could sum up all the book of Hebrews in one sentence, it would be that. Fix your eyes on Christ. And the idea here is, Actually, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, well. Well, anyways. Uh, there was something about that. But it was something specific. Real specific. just don't remember what it was. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Do you, know, do you know there comes a point, if you disobey God for long enough, did you know that there comes a point where you won't want to come back? Did you know that? Did you, did you know that? And did you know that disobeying God now will eventually lead you, if you stay on your course, it will eventually lead you to disbelief in God. Did you know that? When God speaks to you, it is of utmost importance that you obey because your heart will become hardened. And I don't have time to get into Hebrews, but you get kind of the idea of what I'm saying. Luckily, God in his mercy and love and faithfulness and, and his goodness, and you know the thing is, is, did you know that God had every right? Let, let's say that God was obligated to free Israel from Egypt. Let's just say, for the sake of the argument. Did you know that he had every right after that to have destroyed Israel? Let me think. There's a bunch of times. I can't even count them. He, but he had a lot of, a lot of chances, to uh, opportunities, uh, reasons... But yet he didn't. You know what I mean? Even even in his judgment, look how good he was to them. Like 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 Pastor was just saying. So okay. So he goes on to affirm that he is the cause and the prophets are lying. Man, God is just so good. Let me kind of give you a, give you a, a summation of what he's saying. Okay. You're in you're in Babylon, you're gonna be there for seventy more years. Get comfortable, keep on living your life. I've 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 decreed this, nothing's gonna change this. Your, the consequences of your actions are unavoidable. It's going to happen. Don't worry about it. I've got this. Now, 
However, I know what I'm doing, and I've done this for a purpose. I have, the pl- I have plans for you. See, I could have destroyed you, but no, 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 I have plans for you. I have, I, I'm giving you a hope here because you really don't have one. See what I mean? Th- this is kind of the idea of what God is saying here. So some of the things that, that, that we quote and kind of make apply to us are true, but that's not what it's saying here. Does God have plans for us? Does he have a higher purpose for us? Yes. But what he's saying here is that even, even when he disciplined Israel, he did it for a purpose. Even when Israel was in a place that, was, that they were uncomfortable with and that was, for them, really terrible, he did it for a purpose. He had a, he had a plan for what he allowed to happen. He didn't let the chaos just happen. He guided it. And in, in a way, in fact, I'll say it, because in this place it's very explicit that he did not just simply allow it to happen. He caused it to happen. He caused this punishment to happen to bring them back. That's what God does. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yes. A lot of times, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so the main point is Israel, Israel's punishment was given by God, and he was directing it. So how does this really apply to us? This is how it really should apply to us. Don't disobey God, because there are consequences. However, if you do, Seek the throne of grace. Seek the throne of grace. Because God may have mercy on you and only give you a slight punishment as to what you really deserve. When you mess up, when you disobey, seek his face. And from Hebrews and from... We keep going. (laughs) When something is an overarching theme in the Bible, you might want to start paying attention to it. You know, like, for instance, we were talking about this in Yam. So good. Hebrews is, is, is such a good book. You know what? No. No. You guys don't get to hear that. Oh. <laughs> Jeremiah, so Romans 8, 28. Not all, things, not all things will make me happy, but God divinely directs all things to bring growth within the body of Christ. That's Romans 8, 28 summed up. I'll read that again. Not all things will make me happy. But God divinely directs all things, all, all of our trials, all of our failures. He directs all that to bring growth within the body of Christ. That's Romans 8.28 in summation. Uh, Jeremiah 29.11. Um, not God is only good in life for, for me since he wants me to always be happy. That's not what it's saying. But God brings discipline to his people, a discipline that he is in control of, which he brings because he loves and wants to see growth. So the gospel is not about I. It's about God glorified and others reached. You know, Hebrews talks about this too. Um, when you disobey God, you are holding up Christ to be mocked. When you are living in disobedience to God, you are holding up Christ to be mocked. Everyone around you is seeing this. It's not just all about you and what you are comfortable with. You are holding up Christ to be mocked, and people are seeing what should be a change and a growth in you, not being a great change and a growth, but a stubborn, hard heart, uh, but a stubborn, hard heart. So our motivations in life have to be driven by desiring to glorify God. We have to be reaching out to others. Th- this is something that, that, that for Christians should be. God wants us to be taken in meat, not to be drinking milk all of our lives. Does that make sense? He wants us to be growing, to be moving somewhere. If we are in the same spot today as we were two years ago today, something is wrong. Something is wrong. It's normal to have times of... times of struggle. That's normal, okay? It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. Sometimes it is, but not always. But when you are day after day the same person, something's wrong. The Christian life is about growth. It's about discipleship. It's about pressing to Christ. Are your eyes fixed on Christ or are they fixed on yourself? And, you know, Pastor and I were talking about this. What we like to do is we like to fix our eyes on the problem. 
do we need a loan to buy a house? We're all, I, we get our eyes on the loan. If this loan company goes through, it's God's will. No, no, no. Don't even, just no, no. Fix your eyes on Christ and trust in Him. Your, your trust isn't in that loan company. The loan may fall through, but your, your, your trust wasn't in that loan company. It was in God. And if God wants you, to get, wants you to get the money, He'll get you the money. Don't worry about that. See what I mean? When, when, we, when we have a car that breaks down, we get focused on, well, I have to take it to this mechanic and do, 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 and, you know, all this different stuff. God will make a way. You just have to look to Christ. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, please hear me. I'm not saying you should sit back and, oh, God will solve all my problems. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying when you fix your eyes on Christ and seek the kingdom of God, all these other things God will take care of. It's all right. God's got it under control. God's got it under control. Even when he disciplines us, he's still in control. Even when he disciplines us. So, um, I, say, I, I say that to bring us to the point of the selfish gospel. And we'll get more into this next time, whenever that is. But um, Satan wants you to focus on you. So what we're going to do tonight, and then whenever I finish this, is we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be, be conscious about making the gospel no longer about I. Does everybody have their piece of paper? Okay, we're going to write three things on there, okay? Three things. The first thing, write one, and do not share this with anybody, okay? Write one person down who you really hate. I mean, you l- be honest here. It, God knows who you really just hate. You really hate this person. They are really annoying. You don't like being around them. You'd rather they just don't exist. You hate this person, okay? And uh, here, here's a test. The first person that popped in your head. <laughs> That's the test. <laughs> When I said the person you hate, there was someone who popped in your head. Put that person's name down. <laughs> Next thing, everybody got that? Okay, well then, the, so the person who you dislike what they do the most. <laughs> okay, number two. Write one thing in life that is irritating. A business deal, a sin that you keep stumbling over, anxiety, depression, or some other weakness. Something that is just irritating. Just one thing. One thing... In life, that is irritating. Either a business deal, or a sin that you keep stumbling over, or anxiety, or something that you... Yes, for you personally. Something that is irritating you. Like, um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, I just can't seem to get over my alcoholism. That is something that is irritating you. Okay? Got, kind of got the idea? Okay, number three. Write an area of life you think you don't include um, God in. An area of life that you think you do not include God in. Work, uh, family, school, uh, just something that you feel like God is not the center of it. Okay, so first off, the person who you dislike or that rubs you the wrong way. What we're going to do this week, and actually just keep doing it until I preach the second half of this. Just keep going. I don't know. Ask Pastor. Uh, it might not happen. Ask him. <laughs> uh, okay. We're going to commit to pray for, th- pray for this person each day. Can we do that? Can we say that we'll take five minutes, five minutes out of each day, every day. Sunday is a day off for, for work, not for prayer. Okay? All right? So we're going to pray for them on Sunday, too. Is that okay? Can we do that? Okay. Uh, we're going to pray for them at least five minutes every day and put it somewhere you will not forget. Okay, put it on put it on your on your dashboard in your car, and you can pray for them on your way to work. Put them on your do- bedroom door that every time you close the bedroom door, you can see it. Okay, uh, you can remember if you want to remember. Let's just put it like that. Um, so we're gonna commit to pray for that person five minutes every day. And then next, what are we gonna pray for them for? Has anybody heard the song "I'll Pray for You," where he says, you know? Uh, I pray that your car breaks down and that your brakes go out on a down, on a, on a, when you're driving downhill, that a pot falls on your head. Have you heard that song? No? Well, it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, but so what are we going to pray for them for? We're going to pray for one. We're going to pray for their welfare. Did you hear? We're going to pray for their welfare, that they are, that, th- for their financial uh, th- situations, for their, for their family life, for their work. We're going to pray for their welfare. Um, And then second thing, the Bible says, bless. Bless and do not curse. And you should read the section that comes immediately before that. 
He's talking about authority. He's talking about the government that we hate so much, and it says, bless, I mean, bless, bless and do not curse. Read it. That's what he says. You know what, you know what that tells me? We need to bless and not curse, even the things that are most irritating to us. And you know, the time that he wrote that was probably around 60 AD, there were some emperors in there who were kind of not good people. You know, killing, killing Christians left and right and just overall, you know, exalting themselves as God. Just bad people. Um, so yeah, w- pray, pray prayers of blessing for that person. Five minutes every day, just a prayer of blessing. That's all you're going to do. Lord, I, I pray that you would, I pray that you would provide, provide for them. Help them to, help them to have, have the food that they need for the day. Help them to have the food that they need for the day. Help them to have the gas for their car to get to where they need to go. Help, 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 help me to be a witness to them that I would bring them in. See what I mean? What is the focus on in this prayer? What is the focus on? On God's glory and on that other person. You are no longer concerned about how you feel about that person. You're focusing your attention on how God feels about that person. Uh, somebody, re- yeah, Sandy? Pray for them to receive everything you've ever wanted. Yeah, buddy. Right? But then when it comes to blessing someone else, all of a sudden, no. Oh. Like, um, Pastor was telling that story about, about that person that, that, that God told him to give the $25 to, remember? And he didn't want to. See what I mean? His focus was on what? Him. He, his focus was on his, on his attitude. And don't look down on pastor. This happens to all of us. Uh, uh, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to talk bad about pastor. I'm, I'm just saying. We all struggle with this. Don't feel like you're alone in this. You know? Um, now, the person, th- I mean, the thing in life that is irritating, what we're going to do for until, until, the next, until the next time I, time I finish this up, is first off, we're going to stop for a minute. And the, do you know what Psalm says? It says, be still and know that I'm God. No, you know, is it Psalms? I don't know. But anyways, it says, be still and know that I'm God. It's, it's in there somewhere. Look, Google it. Google it. <laughs> um, okay. So, so first what you need to do is you need to stop what you're doing and realize that God uses those things and even guides them um, so you will grow. Realize that. It's just stop and realize that these things that you're getting so irritated at God wants to use it to bring growth. Okay? God wants to use it to bring growth. Do you, the person that, you, that irritates you at work, your spouse sometimes, you know God uses them? Bill Gothard, I love Bill Gothard. One of his things, he was, t- he was talking about youth conflicts, parent and youth conflicts. And he, and he said this. He said, oftentimes, parents will try, I mean, kids will try to find um, uh, safety from, the, from their parents, from their spouse. And then God uses their spouse to work in the same thing that they ran away from their parents for. Amazing, isn't it? It's almost like God knew you all along, huh? <laughs> so for the first thing we're going to do is we're going to stop and realize that God can use this. God can use this. Whatever it is, God can use it. Get the focus off of you and realize that God, has, God, God can do things. Um, and so, and so first off, that you will grow. And then also, your growth is for what? Why do you, why do you need to grow? So that you can help others grow. Even, even our service to the Lord is not for the sake of ourselves. It's for the sake of others. See how that works? The focus is always on someone else, either God or other people, but never on ourselves. It's not a selfish gospel. Um, And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to commit to surrender them to God. Whatever that irritating thing is, we're going to commit to surrender to God. We're not going to try to stick our hands and solve it ourselves. We're not going to try to try to understand it. We're not going to sit there and irritate ourselves and take up the time that we could be praying or, or reading the Bible with just sitting there worried and getting all irritated about it. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to commit to surrender to God. What does that mean? Every single time it enters your mind, you're going to instead think, so, think on good things, things, things that glorify God. You're going to change your thought pattern, okay? You're going to focus on something else. Um, and, then you're, and then also you're going to pray that his will be done every day. When you're going through that, just pray this. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Eventually you'll mean it. You won't mean it at first. It's okay. You will eventually. And when you do start meaning it, keep praying it. Keep praying it. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Whatever's going on, Lord, if you, want me to, if you want this to happen, see, a lot of times we take our wants and make them needs. I want this car. Okay, now I need this car. 
God, you need to provide this car for me. And then we try to get a loan. Oh, the loan goes through for the car that we don't really need, that, but that we think that we need. So then the loan doesn't go through. And then we, we try to make it like a thing on God, you know what I mean? Where it's like, okay, God, you, you need to resolve this and do, 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 do. And it's like, you know, did you ask God whether you needed it in the first place? Remember, if God is truly the master of our finances, we need to ask him before we purchase. Uh, I know a pastor, well, I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Uh, he, he took a fast for one year, and he said, I will not buy anything from me. Food isn't included, duh, because you can't fast for a year from food. That's just dumb. You know, but basically, like, you're not going to go on Amazon and shop. You're not going to go to Walmart and, oh, I want this. No, no, no purchase for, purchases for yourself for one year. And after that year, he realized how many things he didn't need that he was buying. And he had all kinds of money. And what could he do with that money? He could buy uh, shoes for homeless people. He could give money to orphans. <sighs> See, when we get our eyes off of us, we are able to set the captives free. See how that works? Uh, Pastor was talking this last fast about the fast that sets the captive free. Your fast can't set, set the captive free if it's focused on yourself. When you are fasting, are you, uh, I know we would all say no to this, but are you trying to manipulate God's arm in this? Are you trying to manipulate God's arm? Are you fasting for the purpose that you can set the captive free so that you can, you can glorify God? You know, God, I, I want to be using the gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to go on a fast and just try to get more in tune with your heart. You, what is your desire? Your desire is to glorify God. See what I mean? But if you're fasting into this, you know, I'm going through this, this tough situation, I think I'll fast. You know, it's a good thing to seek after God when you're going through a tough situation. But realize that your motivation sometimes is all about you. So... And then, so, uh, this is how we kind of run our lives. We have a list. This, no, we're getting to number three here. We, we have our list, and we try to put God at the first, and then, you know, family, then work, and then, you know, we have it down pretty good. But the thing is, did you know that God is not supposed to be on that list? Well, not, he's not supposed to be on the list. He's not supposed to be number one. He's supposed to be the more, the, what your whole life encompasses. When you go to work, it's supposed to be this. I am working to bless my boss. I'm working to bless my boss. Your boss is in your best interest so that when you bless him, it may turn his heart to God. See? Your focus is no longer on yourself, is it? No. Your God has now, has now taken over your work life and changed your whole reason why you work. Changed the whole reason why you work. See what I mean? That's what happens when you take God off the list and make the list revolve around uh, the, the, everything on that list is like a little circle. We're throwing those the, those little circles inside a pool of water. God's the water. See how that works? Okay. So, what we're going to do with that is we're going to commit to glorify him in that thing the, in life that you think you don't include God in. We're going to commit to glorifying him in it and pray that everything you do would be from motivation to glorify God. That everything that you do in that area would be because you have a motivation in your heart to glorify God. Okay? Does everybody, everybody understand that? We're not going to go to prayer tonight. Uh, well, actually, I, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. But we're not going to go to our regular prayer. Um, but I just want to make sure that everybody kind of understands the idea here. Any questions? Okay, I always try to try to give people the opportunity to ask questions at the end in case I didn't clarify things. I, in summation, there's your assignments for the for the next couple weeks. This is for your the, the you know you will find a you will find a benefit from this. You will. I know right now it kind of seems like whoa, but you will, you will. Um, and obviously that shouldn't be your motivation, or else you're doing it for the wrong reason. But if you're doing it for the wrong reason, keep doing it. Eventually you'll do it, do it for the right reason. So, so in conclusion, in conclusion, the gospel is not about us. It's not about us.